Well, hey there, and welcome back to The Commonplace. My name is Autumn Kern, and today we are going to be talking about tea time for the common mom, because tea time is such a fun thing. There are, of course, philosophical things behind it that I'm going to discuss. However, it is something that I think a lot of moms see on Instagram or on Pinterest, and they're like, ah, what is this magical education where children drink tea and they read books, and how do I do it, right? But with things like the aesthetics of Instagram or Pinterest or just the wild imagination of a good mom, tea time can become something that can feel like a burden or feel unattainable. Like how in the world could I do this every day? Bake fresh bread every single day, yada, yada, yada. And I am here to tell you the very good news that tea time is just an ordinary life rhythm. And I've got some tips on how to do it well on the every day because we do our tea time every day and also why you should do tea time. Like what is actually the heart behind tea time? Is it just this cutesy old fashioned -y thing that Charlotte Mason moms like or is there an actual reason that we do it? So if you are new here, again, my name is Autumn. The Commonplace is both a podcast and the Common Mom videos and we talk about how to connect the classical Charlotte Mason pedagogy of formal education to every part of life so that we can make truth, goodness, and beauty something we embody in our homes and our children see at every turn. Whew, that was a very long sentence. So yes, like I said, today we're talking about tea and obviously as I just threw this mug around, there is nothing in here, but it's my prop for the day. We have a nice gloomy day. It would be a good day to have tea and we are about near three o'clock, which is tea time at my house. So the first thing to realize about tea time is that it is something without measure. And this is a classical principle that I love to talk about and that we are not educating with a utilitarian mindset. You go to school, get good grades, you can get to a good college, so you can get a good job, so you can make money. That's utilitarian. That's not why we educate. We actually educate to enrich the lives of our children, which means there are some things we do that are just without measure. Tea time is one of those things. It fills up the child. And when we do something without measure, it means that we're not looking to get an outcome at the end of it. We are trusting that the day by day or weekly habit of doing something over the course of a child's life in our home will shape the contours of who they are probably in slow, imperceptible ways for most of that time. Like the idea of the ocean lapping against the shore, if you just go look at it every day, you're like, hmm, kind of looks like it did yesterday. But then when you go 10 years later, you're like, wow, this looks like a very different beach. If you go 20 years later, even more so. And that is the idea of enriching a child's life without measure. And tea time, I think, is one of those things. So for a lot of people, when they sit down for tea, it is a time that they might do something like their beauty loop or their common subjects. They are going to bring out artist, composer, poetry, recitation, scripture memory, different things like that seem to go well with tea time. I will say that for young children, your hands are busy. Your mouth is busy. They are, they are not able to talk and interrupt you because they're drinking their tea and they're eating their snack. And also it's a time where it's easy to crowd around books and things like that. And so that's kind of the picture that most people have for Charlotte Mason tea time. And I think it's a good one because we do pursue beauty and we do look at things like lovely paintings or listen to lovely composer pieces because we are trying to set the appetitive taste of our children towards what is actually beautiful and will satisfy and nourish their souls. And so tea time a lot of times can, can center around the beauty things that we bring in our home education. But we've used it in a couple of ways. So in the very early years, we had tea time. It was slightly a lengthier thing. We really built it out so that we had this whole, we're the society of colonels who drink tea. We have a name. Our family has a lot of opening liturgies for things that we do. So I'll say something, the kids recite something back. We would open our tea time. There's lots of banging on the table, lots of here, 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 here. Now my kids have really gotten into accents, so we also have a lot of fun with accents, but you don't have to do those for tea time. And we would then do our benediction table, which I've talked about before. It was our, our version of morning time when all of my kids were pre-formal lessons. We would do our family rule, we would do some poetry, we would do Bible reading, we might talk about habits. We would do a lot of different things for the early years. It's kind of just a check-in point where we could all come together and do something like that in a way that really was helping me stay organized in the early years, making sure that I was forming these pegs and hooks that have continued to serve us now that we've moved into more formal education. Our benediction table time has changed as we now have a formal student, and so that's shifted for the whole crew into part of the school day. And so we don't use tea that way anymore, but that is a way I think it can be really beneficial in the early years. It gives a stop point in the day for you to make sure that you are intentionally laying good things before your children, rather than just getting caught up in what is 
a lot of physical needs in the early years, particularly if you have a lot of young children, you've had them close together like I did, and you're like, everyone needs a diaper change and everyone needs a snack and everyone needs to go outside for a little bit. Oh, it's nap time again. And all of a sudden the day's kind of gone. Tea time gave us a set point at which we were able to pursue these things in a more organized way. I have another video which I'll link about what you do in the early years building a whole life that is made up of these things so that it doesn't feel like this is when we do the really good Charlotte Mason stuff and this is just crazy town. It actually just becomes your life is pursuing these, these gifts of God for us. And so that's how it was for us at the beginning. Now it's switched, so I wanna explain that too. We do two, two tea times a day. The first is at 10 o'clock. We used to have our old tea time at 11, so it was 11 C's. But now it's at 10, it's right smack in the middle of formal lessons, and it is a 10 minute tea break. That is it. We go, we get our cups of tea. I read a couple of poems either from our poet for the year or just some fun poems from um, favorite poems, old and new. We really like Robert Louis Stevenson as well, so we have the Garden of Verses. And we will just read a couple poems it's whatever I see, whatever I want, a kid, a kid might request one, and it's only 10 minutes, and it's just a good break spot for us in the middle formal lessons. Our formal tea time is at three o'clock, and there are a couple of reasons for that, but it is when we come together, we pause whatever's happening, and we all grab a cup of tea, we all have a little snack, and I do our read aloud. It is our guaranteed read aloud time with mom during the day, and I'll read a couple of chapters. Now, we do this, and I wanna give some parameters around it so you then have the right ideal of what's going on. Because it is supposed to be a life-giving thing that fills up the people at the table, I do not try to make it look like an Instagram square. Sometimes we have a full spread of fresh baked goods, and sometimes we have plates of of crackers and hummus and pepperoni or salami and cheese. Like sometimes it's a veggie plate, apples and peanut butter. These are all great options for snack time. Um, it's, it's not always this idyllic square because the underlying thing about this, the heartbeat about tea time is that you're actually trying to fill up the souls of the people at the table, fill up their minds, fill up their literal bodies with the, the, the good treat with something tasty. And in doing that, sometimes in the course of ordinary life, it's going to just be something simple. And sometimes you have the margin to make it something really special, but it's the everyday habit of stopping for what is good and what is beautiful that actually is the point. And so that means in our house, I will tell, I have two young boys after my daughter, my kids are six, four and two. I will say to the boys, your mouth must be quiet, but you may move your hands and feet. So they'll finish their snack. They'll go grab their Legos. They'll finish their teacup. They'll go grab a book. They'll go grab magnet tiles, whatever it is. And they'll sit down and keep building while I read. Well, my oldest is going to sit there there, slowly sipping her tea enthralled with the story. But the point is not that I'm saying everyone must sit here and we must be perfectly proper and we must have everything in order in order to have tea time. No, I'm teaching my children that we come to what is good and beautiful and we do it in a regular way that is actually doable for the common mom. So a couple of tips on how to make this doable. One is to bake once a week. And so whether that be a huge batch of cookies, fresh baked bread, banana bread, a scone, something fun like that, never, never despise bread because toast is a magical thing. Honey, butter, cinnamon, sugar, jam. You could do a lot with a piece of toast. Um, but you just bake once and then that's only for tea time. And so it doesn't get gobbled up really quickly and you can space it out over the week, which really does help. And then once it's gone, it's gone and you're just you're down to the apples and peanut butter or apples and Nutella or something like that snacks for tea time. And it, it can be something small. You, you don't need a full spread. So one of the reasons why we do it at three o'clock is that it keeps that witching hour or that pre-dinner hour where kids kind of go crazy from happening because the kids have had a snack. They've had, you know, a set time with mom. They've calmed down a little bit there at three so that by the time we eat dinner at six, they're not going crazy demanding food at 4.30 while I'm trying to cook. That's another great part about tea time. And I think that's why in all the really good old books you had tea before you had dinner. Another way to do it is to teach your kids how to prep tea time. So this is a helpful thing that I should mention. We do use the hot water nozzly thing on our espresso machine to get our water very quickly. That's why we can have a 10 minute tea time during lessons. I understand this. Some people are like, how do you boil water so quickly? I don't, I get it out of the espresso machine, but all of my kids know how to grab out their mug, put a tea bag in, and then put it in there and get their hot water. So everyone can help prep for tea, which is, really wonderful. Um, additionally, consider how you serve tea. So when we only had our tea time once a day, I would let my kids have, you know, their lump full of sugar and then as much cream as they wanted. Because we do make tea time such an ordinary thing, my children think they are British and they now make tea time 
whenever they want. So they have their own little teas whenever they feel the urge, which is often. So I've had to nix the sugar because that can actually start to make your tea times go haywire if your kids are really sugared up and instead we're just using honey. Still tastes great. Kids blood sugar seems to be a little more stabilized. So I did want to make that note for the mom who's like, sure, have cups of tea. Autumn's kids make them all day. Well, Autumn's kids can't have that much sugar because they'd go crazy and then it wouldn't be fun to have tea time. You have to think about this. Your child is a whole person, right? They have a body. You have to care for the body too. That's important. So you don't despise the simple snacks. You maybe bake once a week. You have your kids help prep and that makes it really easy. And if you're looking for a tea, we do suggest Yorkshire Gold. It is our favorite. We order it in massive quantities and that's pretty much all we drink. And you do make it weak for the younger kids. These are just little common sense tips that we picked up along the way. Okay, my candle's out because I was done recording and then I remembered I forgot to tell you one of the best things, <laughs> light a candle. If you have young children and you find that you were like, I'm trying to introduce them to these amazing things we talk about in this world or in my Patreon, because I do hear this a lot from my patrons, and my kid is just not down with it. They are like, ugh, I don't like the books you're reading. I don't like the music you're playing. I don't want to hear poetry for 20 minutes. It's because you really shouldn't be doing it for 20 minutes. Start small. That's another thing about tea time. If tea time is new, start small. I will frequently say to people, well, did you give them a cup of hot cocoa? And did you make them sit for longer than 10 minutes for the very young years, the pre-six? And people are like, oh, that's all it has to be? Yeah, when you start, that's all it has to be. You don't need a full spread. You need a couple of funny poems or you need some really good picture books and you need something tasty for the kids. And that is the way to get them to the table. Of course, always lighting a candle helps, which is why I had this candle in the frame and then completely forgot to talk about it. But just lighting a candle adds it's a certain level of magic and ceremony. And you don't want to be like the modern man who has the terrible habit of doing ceremonious things unceremoniously, as C.S. Lewis would say. Instead, you want to bring that into your child and your child will feel a certain rise to the occasion may not be perfect, but that is how I recommend starting. And lastly, one of the really great things that I love about particularly three o'clock tea time for us, since we have it in the afternoon, is that everything just pauses for tea. I could be in the middle of folding laundry. There could be crumbs on the kitchen counter from someone making a snack a little bit earlier. There could be Lego creations on the table that we just slide over, but we stop in the middle of everything else to come and do this. We don't have to make everything perfect to have a really good tea time. And I think that's an important thing for homeschooling moms to really master in their own minds is that you are not working to get to this perfect moment that then you plug your children into so that it looks like the idealized version of a Charlotte Mason education that you've probably seen on the internet. That's not what we're doing. We're actually teaching our children how to live. What is the good life? What is the flourishing life? I know, I'm always talking about this, but that is the point of being a person. The flourishing life is life in Christ. It is submitting to God's way. It is encountering his world with the heart of a humble, excited, curious, worshipful person. That's living. And we're actually trying to teach our children how to live, not how to need perfect circumstances in order to have joy because that's just not going to happen. And so I truly do see tea time, something as small as every day at three o'clock, something that can nurture your children with those spiritual muscles so they take that into all of life. And going backwards a bit, we called our time benediction table, if you don't know this, if you don't have the guide or you're not part of our Patreon, we called it benediction table because I very much felt like we were coming to the table to be blessed by the gifts that God has given in his world, truth, goodness, and beauty, so that we could then go out and bless others. Everything that we do in this classical world, all of the training towards virtue and wisdom, all of the great books, all of the out of door times and the freedom that you just don't have if you're in school all day, all of those life giving things that we fight for as homeschooling mothers saying that it's important for the formation of our children is not just for them. It's not for keeps. It's to go out and it's to love God and it's to love thy neighbor. And so with something like tea, when you think about what am I bringing to the table in terms of materials, what am I reading? What are we singing? What are we thinking about? What silly goofy conversation are we having because sometimes you're just laughing over tea and that's the great thing. It's so that your children will be nourished in order to go out and love others. And so what you're doing seems small, tossing out apples and peanut butter and cups of tea, but really it all fits into this whole life sacramental vision of the world. And that is what the things you do in your home should be aiming towards. That's the, that's the ultimate thing, right? And so to that end, my last thing is just, if you're using it in the early years, one thing that I became aware of early on when we started this, I started tea time with my daughter when she was 18 months old and I was just about to have our second. And so we've been doing this for a while and there was always the temptation to take tea time away as a 
disciplinary measure, which if you do think like that, maybe watch about principle number four from Mason and the different ways we uh, motivate a child's heart might be helpful. But I really want to encourage particularly moms of young, young kids not to take tea time away as a disciplinary measure. Instead, see it as a point to restore fellowship, which is how it served us so well in the early years. If we were having a great day and everyone was in fellowship and full of joy and it was a jollification party all day long, great. Then we just had tea time and it was great. But if there had been friction or someone had sinned against someone else in our home, tea time stood and it was going to happen. We were going to have the great time of tea time. So we needed to get back in fellowship. And having those fences to help restore your home back to the path of life is really helpful. So just don't take it away. Don't threaten tea time. I really don't want kids to hear they're going to lose their special tea time. I want them to know in my home and in yours that there is something to look forward to. You can always come to the table and you will always be met with love and with grace and with restoration when you come humbly. And I mean that right there could really really translate to a lot of great things in life. So um, I hope that helps making tea time a little bit normal and also understanding why you do it. And so it doesn't have to look a particular way as long as your heartbeat is headed in the right direction. And by all means, throw out some pretzels, grab some tea and sugar and enjoy your time with your kids. Grab a good book. And I am actually going to go get ready for tea because it's near three o'clock at my house. And I hope you enjoy doing the same. I'll see you guys soon.